Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the 19th hole. We are live, as always, on In Between Media. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the whole damn channel, and give that bell a jingle. We are covering the Valspar Championship at Innisbrook, home of the Snake Pit. Another leg on the Florida swing. We're headed to Texas next week, but we got Florida one more time. Bermuda grass, narrow fairways. Let's freaking hit it. on the 19th hole live as always connor coughlin there to my left at <coughs> cough underscore dfs on the x machine slash twitter slash everybody's favorite social media uh message board we have a lot of good stuff to cover this week including recapping uh this guy named uh, dr scott scheffler esquire uh, this guy's this guy's pretty damn good at golf. Uh, Connor, how do you feel in general? I, I want to know how you're doing because I haven't talked to you in seven days. And how do you feel about uh, Sir Scott Scheffler Esquire? He's he's on me. He's he's speechless. <laughs> Uh, and this is what happens when you come in late, running hot. <laughs> uh, he's, no, he's got skid marks sliding into his room there. <laughs> that sounds way worse than what you meant it. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, Scott, <laughs> freaking uh, Scotty, man! I definitely, uh, definitely demonstrating why he's the world number one. Now that he's kind of got that putter together a little bit, and um, you want to? Did you did you see the stat? The stat. So just over that. his last two Sundays, which obviously he won both tournaments uh, on on a, with Sunday charges, like he he won the last two events, the players and the Arnold Palmer on Sunday. His last two Sunday rounds, he gained more than seven strokes putting on the field. Uh, there is not a soul alive that can beat Scotty Scheffler. He's gaining se- uh, three and a half strokes per round on the greens just not possible because yeah even neutral putting is means scotty's gonna win (laughs) 64 on sunday at at sawgrass 64 uh ridiculous well we've been saying that up right along is like if scotty can just get the putter like even flat uh there's pretty much nobody that can beat him but i don't know if it's the putter it might be strokes gained beard I mean, you can't help but notice that mm-hmm. luscious, luscious. Oh, we're not calling Scotty anymore. Until he <laughs> shaves, he is Sir Scott Scheffler Esquire. <laughs> I like he's that bona fide. He's bona fide. United him. So I know. <laughs> I knighted him, and I gave him a. I gave him a Southern title too. <laughs> you ever Esquire. feel like? Do you ever feel like the announcers on the PGA Tour are like just trying to set you up for heartbeat heartbreak? Though, like. I'm watching Wyndham lining up that putt. He's taking a look. He's walking around. They got to do the little uh, monologue about how he's, you know, wearing pink for the first time and in honor of his mom and the foundation. And he's going to do this every Sunday. And uh, and you're just sitting there going, I guarantee he's going to miss this putt now. Now that now they've set it up so that you feel even worse. I let out an audible. Luckily, I was home alone because it was a high pitched like yelp slash scream when that ball hit the lip and and ricocheted back out of the hole it was down but obviously he cooked it way too like it was that ball was moving if he had just like a tiny bit less pace that's in the heart and and it was just i was like as soon as he hit it i was like oh shit he cooked that hard and uh, he's not leaving it short he told all the break out of it and that's what you're supposed to do on a birdie putt that means that much but when it hit the hole and did the full lip out, uh, I let out a gasping shriek in my house, and I was crazy. 
uh, well, I was, was, was I, I couldn't believe it. him <laughs> seeing him uh, double pump or second guess the fist pump. Well, when it hit because he thought it was going in and then he th- then he was like oh shit and then he saw it hit the hole and so he did another step and like oh my I can't like I love Wyndham Clark like I don't like his little uh uh improving of the lies thing but that's gamesmanship a lot of these guys do that he's just been so hot lately and first time he's finished First time the same golfers finished runner up to the same champion in back to back weeks since the 80s. So uh, he's obviously on a heater. Wyndham Clark is, and and I'm a big fan of him. I mean, not just because he's an Oregon Duck, go Ducks, but uh, <laughs> Wyndham Clark's story is incredible. Like we talked about this over the last year or so since he started cooking. He won the when he won the major last year. Uh, we were all cheering for him because this guy turned his whole life around, not just his career. Uh, obviously, he was a big time prospect coming out of college, and he's supposed to be the next th- next big thing, and it didn't pan out for him. But the guy still got immense talent because as soon as he got the mental game right, uh, we've seen the results. So can't discount what Wyndham Clark has done the last few weeks just because he's been slightly overshadowed by the best golfer of this era. Yeah, Scotty. Scotty's making a hell of an argument. He's, I mean, it's just unreal. But uh, the other thing too that I was, I thought was kind of crazy coming down the stretch was you had mentioned Brian Harmon, and I kind of shot you down a little bit. But yeah, um, Harmon was pulling out all the stops to be right there too, and that uh, that shot on eighteen from the pine straw was otherworldly. I didn't think he had any shot at getting anywhere near it. And no, it was crazy. Uh, and then also the other guy that we both said. Uh, doesn't win much because he just doesn't seem to close it out. But Xander Shoffley did everything we that I said he was going to do, which is compete and grind and put and make good shots and be everything you want him to be on that type of course. And however, it got down to he had a very makeable birdie putt on 17 on Sunday and missed it, and that was his chance to for that was his chance to push uh, Scheffler into a playoff situation. And obviously he missed the fairway on 18. So he had no chance at birdie himself, but 17 was his chance. And that was what killed him. And Wyndham Clark was 17 hole. Just Wyndham Clark was the chili dip on Saturday when he tried to, he tried to muscle a gap wedge into a, into a pin where he should have just chopped off a pitching wedge like everybody else was. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Like, doesn't like this is one of the most talented golfers in the entire world, and he hit a chili dip and was in the water twenty yards short of the pin. That that was very relatable, and unfortunately, it cost him. <laughs> well, and Xander, I mean, if you look at Xander too, like, oh, he God, he was so close. He he was, but I mean, man, his Sunday, I, he hung in there, but he left a lot on the course for I mean, him he, to shoot a sixty nine with how well he was playing was it was a huge missed opportunity he was not like he obviously scrambles well he was the best scrambler on the course the whole whole week but he wasn't making birdie putts that was the killer for him on sunday was he had so many chances to make birdies because of his ball striking and he couldn't make any of them yeah we'll see we'll see if uh we'll see how he does this week i mean i i definitely think that a lot of the same stuff that put him where he was last week applies here. So I, I'm hoping he recovers. Uh, and I mean, this is obviously a weaker field, so maybe a little bit of pressure off, but I mean, we'll talk about Xander once we get into it, but for sure. Um, what are you drinking? Anything special? I mean, you lost a, a Coors light bet to me last week in dramatic fashion. You had a huge lead at, at the, at the cut. I think my guy made the cut by two shots and your guys, your guy was up towards the lead after two rounds. And then, the weekend was not kind to Tom Hoagie. Let's just say that. No, no. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not drinking anything. I special. expected that Tom Hoagie to show up on Thursday and Friday, but he, he just he made it a little bit more dramatic. <laughs> it was, it was kind of wild, though. It, I mean, a lot, a lot of people were on Tom Hoagie. So, I mean, not I think uh, we would have had some serious swings had he uh, kind of kept himself in it. But um no nothing special uh like i said i was running a little late so we just grabbed an old standby just some base old forester so it'll get the job done yeah and uh so my birthday is on thursday so i'm gonna go with my favorite daily drinker woodford reserve double oaked not just the regular woodford which is good on its own 
this is the this is the best. Bo's going to be the ripe old age at 24. Man, that would be nice. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, 37. So not really a milestone. I don't really give a shit. But I do have a tee time for Thursday. That's exciting. I get to play golf at Yoshidihi, which is a top 10 public golf course in the United States. Right, that, right out my front door. I would, uh, I would gladly join you if I could. <laughs> I know you would. You'll be dealing with snow there in Sioux Falls, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes, sir. It's well, gonna be 72 and sunny here. <laughs> happy, happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's let's jump into this course, uh, Innisbrook, the Snake Pit, uh, one of my favorite golf courses. You know why? Carnage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the weather is gonna look like carnage. We got wind and rain in the forecast. We got a tough golf course just in neutral settings. So, and we have a weaker field. So, I am expecting we're we're going to get a single digit under par winner this week and I am excited for all the carnage. Let's <laughs> hit the caddy notes drop. All right, well, uh, Innisbrook, the Copperhead Course, the Snake Pit. It's the last leg of the Florida Swing, Connor. How are you feeling about the Copperhead Course in general? Though I'm not normally a Carnage guy, this is one of my favorite ones to watch. I, do, I, <laughs> I, I really Valspar. do like this course. And even like the name Valspar, even though it's a brand of paints, which isn't that exciting, like Go to Home Depot, get your Valspar paints. It just sounds like something a snake would Not love to say. The <laughs> Copperhead, the Copperhead course, it's the Valspar. <laughs> the Valspar. Like I said, not a sponsor. Quit saying their name. We'll have to send them a bill. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's fine. Valspar Championship, uh, Innisbrook Resort, Copperhead Course, Palm Harbor, Florida, uh, par 71, 7,340 yards, Bermuda Fairways, Bermuda Greens, overseeded with POA. Uh, so pretty similar to last week. Uh, course is a pretty brutal test of all around skill. Tee shots are, are going to require accuracy with a bunch of dog legs that'll force you to uh, shape shots in both directions. And the uh, fairways are tree lined. The rough, they uh, tend to grow up and they actually narrow the fairways by letting it grow in a bit, yes. um, which is yes. which is just going to add even more difficulty off the tee here. And it's already hard enough. The uh, approach shots at the, a lot of the force layups are going to come from about 175 plus. I think when you look at the metrics for those proximities, it's something like 75% of the approach shots are going to come in from there. So uh, definitely a distance to look at. <clears throat> you got water in play on several of the holes. Greens are well protected by bunkering. Uh, one of the toughest stretches of golf on the tour, possibly the toughest stretch, depending on who you ask, is the snake pit, which is 16, 17, and 18 here. Tons and tons carnage. and tons, tons of carnage, which is exactly what I was going to say. Uh, and it also, you hope that we've got a tight race coming home on Sunday because it makes for really, really good drama and TV. So mm -hmm. uh, one other thing, too, that is of note with this place is it's kind of a unique hole layout. You've got four par fives and five par threes. So you really need to take advantage of the par five scoring and also have guys that can at least not lose strokes on par threes consistently. Especially longer par threes. I think uh, four of the five are 200 plus. Yes, sir. And you already alluded to it, but the weather is probably going to get pretty gnarly. We're going to have um, Friday. Yeah, it sounds like Saturday, sun. Uh, sa I'm sorry, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, though, you're still going to have sustained wind around 15 plus miles an hour, which is not the end of the world, but it def definitely adds some complexity here. Uh, rain, rain. I didn't see a ton of in the forecast. It, it's possible, um, but it is going to be uh, pretty mild temperatures. So uh, we're going to hope uh, we're going to hope the wind dries it out a little bit. We'll get even more carnage. But uh, yeah, projected. they they there was wind uh, rain in the forecast on Friday, so the weekend might be soft. The Thursday afternoon swing, like the splits this week, are going to favor the morning players on Thursday. 
So if you're looking at building showdown lineups for Thursday and Friday, pay attention to this to who's teeing off when because the morning players on Thursday are going to have an advantage because the wind is going to pick up in the afternoon on Thursday. And it's going to persist. It's going to be consistent weather on Friday, but having that early split on Thursday is going to be a favorable one because before the weather enters the fray, you're going to have that uh, that group of guys out there playing in decent, mild weather versus what they're going to see late Thursday and then all day Friday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. And to, to your point, it is going to be pretty much all day Friday. I mean, that could change. Yeah. But the the bulk or the I guess the yeah, the main bulk of that wind is going to be kind of late morning into like middle afternoon. So there really isn't a whole lot of uh, tea time split advantage on Friday. But so to Bo's point, um, if you can get the guys early on Thursday, because that's going to be some of your better scoring opportunities. We don't, um, we don't talk about this very often because it doesn't always come into play or it, we don't always have a chance to forecast it on a Tuesday. But uh Tea time splits. Usually if a guy has a morning tea time on Thursday, he plays the afternoon on Friday and vice versa. So they go out in reverse order each day of the first two rounds. And then they go by order of standings on the weekend after the 36 hole cut. We don't talk about this a lot, but that de- that's a detail that comes into play this week with a very clear, uh, messy weather forecast for Friday. Yep, 100%. So it's definitely something to look at. And just like anytime we talk about weather, uh, if you can hold off on, uh, especially in DFS, really hold off on really, really locking in the lineups until maybe uh, late Wednesday night. Um, just try and get the best read on the weather in the spring. I almost built out a bunch of lineups earlier today, and I was like, wait, just wait. I don't have to be, I don't have to be there today. <laughs> Oh, I built my off the wall ones. We'll talk about them later. But I built I my core favorites. At least I at least built some lineups with my twenty four guys in the in the immediate pool. I might add some more that you bring up on the show today. Uh, you think uh, probably about ten under here. My cut line maybe around plus two, maybe plus plus one, plus two. Um, I think with the weather being nasty on Friday, but softer on the weekend. I think you're about right because it's only been under it's only been better than 10 under par twice. And that was Sam Burns and his back to back wins in 21 and 22. He won at 17 under. And I think uh, VJ Singh won here at 18 under, which was the, the course record. But that's the only time that this championship has been decided with a score better than 10 under par. Uh, so scoring is better this year in general. I think that the, the quality of golf. People like to harp on the loss of quality players to the live tour, but I think it's the opposite. I think we're getting more lesser known names that are rising to the occasion. The quality of golf on the PGA tour has never been better. And it shows in the overall scoring at some of these very distinct courses that aren't necessarily set up any easier than they have been in previous years. But these guys have uh, as a whole have, that's been just better scoring this year. So I would say that 10 under par, maybe even 11 is the number to hit this week, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough. Yeah. If the weather does what it says it's going to do, I think we're going to stick right around that, you know, somewhere between 10 and 12 is, is probably right. 12 on the high end. Yeah. If, um, if we get a little bit of moisture and the wind subsides a little bit, I, you could be getting into those middle teens. So, um, you know, again, it'll play it by ear. The nice thing about the final score is that it's not crucial to building like DraftKings lineups, um, you know, because everybody's everybody's going to be scoring in the same conditions. So uh, but it is something to think about when you're building out. So lots um, of tea to green emphasis this week, though, right? For sure. Uh, approach was obviously a major thing, especially from the longer distances. I looked at the 175 yep. to 200, 200 plus. Yeah, uh, good good drive gained was another one that yep. I looked at pretty heavily, just making sure that the guys can set themselves up for their approach. Scrambling is another sticky stat here, especially from uh, outside of 30, 40 yards, which is actually isolates quite a few people because that's kind of an oddball uh, scrambling distance. And then uh, I already talked about it a little bit, but shots gained on par threes and par fives and then bogey avoidance to uh, to kind of couple with that. So we got guys that are scoring when they can and not giving them back. Um, right. Yeah. I think, uh, 
I think what I what I went to was also your standard birdies are better gained is a solid stat every week. Bogey avoidance, of course. And then uh, the proximity distances I sprinkled in a little heavier. Obviously, this is a Bermuda course, so uh, putting on Bermuda, especially over the last 36 rounds, is important. And then I went with, uh, yeah, greens and regulation gained because uh, the off the tee is very important here, but approach is everything here. Strokes gained on approach and greens and regulation gained. They're slightly different stats that support one another on this course. And that is... Uh, you you have to be able to find the fairway here, which isn't easy at all. But you also have to take that found fairway or even missed fairway, and you have to put the ball on the putting surface because otherwise, scrambling around these greens, they're built like potato chips. They're not flat. They're not easy. Uh, Bermuda's already got the grain to consider. The wind is going to be a factor. I think the best approach players in varying weather circumstances and guys that can work it both ways For uh, sure. that's the guys that we that aren't going to pop up in the stat model necessarily because not very many very few courses these days especially parkland golf courses like this demand shot shaping like you can get away with like scotty scheffler is almost primarily a left to right ball flight and a high one and he doesn't get to he, there. There aren't many courses that force him to draw the ball. And this, if he was here this week, he would be forced to draw the ball a lot more than he was comfortable doing. So I look for guys like Xander who can work the ball both ways pretty easily. Sam Burns is another guy that's at the top of this betting card that uh, you can, there's no wonder he's had success here because these are both guys that are very talented at moving the ball up, down, left or right whatever the shot calls for. And it's, it's kind of a dying art because of how, how much less emphasis on shot making there is on these modern type golf courses. I no, think I the only that. thing that I would maybe add to your, uh, everything you just said was, I think people get in the habit of assuming that scrambling means around the green scrambling doesn't, yeah. that's not really what scrambling is. Scrambling is, recovering from a missed fairway or recovering mm -hmm. from a missed green, green getting up and down. That's all it is. It means and if you miss, you miss your target, how well do you score afterward? Yep. hundred percent. And so I think that that's where you look at some of the longer scrambling metrics and that, that would include where people are missing the fairways and being playing in from the rough. So uh, definitely, definitely something to think about, but uh, yeah, getting into it. All right, let's twirl some clubs and bet on some golf. What do you say? Let's win some money, baby. Brad, Chad, and Thad. Killing it. Killing it. Just out there sinking putts and breaking hearts. <laughs> Twirling clubs, <laughs> crashing golf carts. Oh, the glory days of those gentlemen. Oh, so what do you think? Uh, top of the board, Mr. Sheesh. Xander Shoffley. <laughs> and and this is the thing with with uh, guys, I you know, you know me, I don't like betting the short favorites very often like i last the last two weeks we both acknowledged scotty scheffler we both said hey i mean there's a reason why he's here there's a reason why he's plus 550 plus 650 he's very likely to win and although it might not be in our taste to bet that guy you if if, if somebody else is watching saying well, if he's that damn good, then why wouldn't I just bet him? And if he wins, he wins. And that's what a lot of people did. We got feedback from last week's show that they said that they took from us that Scotty might win. And it was a very high likelihood. So they won money betting Scotty based off our advice to maybe trust your tolerance. Uh, this week, the short odds favorite is Xander Shoffley. And uh, let's see, his recent odds are down to plus 650. I wouldn't normally play a Xander Shoffley here. You know why? Because this dude never wins anything. 
And you would think that he would because I'm looking at my model and he's number one by such a huge margin that I'm looking at going, well, why wouldn't I why wouldn't I bet on Xander Shoffley to win this tournament? On paper, he should. It's true. On paper, you're looking at Xander Shoffley going, he is the class of this field. And however, no. I'm not betting Xander at plus 650. I would bet him at plus 850 or or longer. But at plus 650, you can't do it. You can't do it because there's too many similar golfers with similar levels of skill who have more winning history than Xander Shoffley. And even his top five numbers only plus 175. That's not good enough for me. I need plus 200 or better to bet him on a top five. So the books are getting a bunch of money on Xander Shoffley for obvious reasons. I just can't do it at this number. That's my advice. Yeah, Xander Shoffley is always going to rate out well. He's like he's like an elite stat darling. Like every week, yeah. he's gonna like he's gonna be. And he's kinda... pretty much a top ten automatic bid. Like he's yeah. he's top ten just about every week. Yeah, but and it, I mean he it... doesn't win more than twice a year. Well, and I was going to say, rich like, man's Tony Fee now. <laughs> if you want to do something that's short, if you want to do something that's short odds, go after the minus one ten on him to be a top ten. That's guaranteed, almost. I mean, you could, yeah. you could definitely. That's a double up. That's a double there. up. A clean, a pretty much a clean double up right there. So that would be that'd be maybe the only action on Shoffley I'd be looking at. I I personally don't like. I don't trust him to win. I trust him to be right there, like he tends to be. And then, um, you know, I just he's obviously like, a top five golfer in the world he just isn't he he doesn't he's not known for finishing at least not in the last two seasons it doesn't feel like he's got that anymore and and, and realistically it you know almost well and in, in one case more than double the odds of him i i really like sam burns a ton this week sam burns is the guy that i want to i want to bet at and and put a lot of money behind because he's got he great there <laughs> Great course history here. And when you look at his stats, he actually like his strokes gained on this yeah. course at this tournament are are two to four strokes better in every category uh, than his career averages. So it's a course Sheesh. that uh, it's a course that really just suits suits his eye. And I see I really think yeah. that he's going to make a run at it. And it's not like he's in terribly bad form. And no, plus he's in pretty good form. Yeah, I'll, t I'll I mean, I'll take double the odds from Xander to for sure. I mean, it just seems like um, it seems like that's an easy easy call. Just playing devil's advocate here. I'm not going to argue against Sam Burns because it's undeniable he loves it here. He's never poor, played poorly here. But another side of the coin to that is maybe he's due for some regression because this guy is not known for being a great putter on Bermuda, but seems like around here he he has his best performances putting at the Valspar compared to everywhere else he plays. And maybe that's not something that's sustainable. That's just me being devil's advocate saying that maybe Sam Burns uh, is, pl was playing out of his mind the last few years here and because he likes it so much, but maybe even a little bit of a change in conditions, like the weather being a factor could throw him off of that, of that elite form that he's had at the Valspar. I could see the weather playing into it because if you do look at his his two wins here, they were in really good scoring conditions. Um, you know, well, obviously because he had seventeen <laughs> under both times, and that's not not very very uncommon for this tournament. But to the putting thing, he has been gaining strokes uh, putting since going back to the century. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, he's had a couple of. Yeah. four four stroke gained weeks and and i granted i understand that's on different surfaces but the putter has been hot and it has been hot for better part of three months now so i don't see that going away this week i i get i get the cause for concern but i i think that this is a sam burns course and i don't know that i'm gonna say that a whole lot of times this year speaking of burns uh justin thomas burned both of us last week so are we back in at plus 1400 because this course fits Justin Thomas's game really well. I think I am. I, th I think I'm going to go back to I want to be, right? You want to be. 
<laughs> if I mean, if you want to get into weird math and narratives, I mean, he's going <laughs> T12 cut, T12 cut. So hey, <laughs> he should, he's by due. that logic, <laughs> we should be in the top 10 this week at least. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I, I like, I don't like Jordan Spieth here because no. off the tee is so important. Brian Harmon, even, I'm not a huge fan of here because of the difference in the rough here and being a, putting an emphasis on approach really takes me off of Harmon. Like he's great off the tee, but his approach game has been the weakness. Like his scrambling so strong, his putting has been hot, but this course could eat him up. And at 20 to one, it's just too short for me at, for Brian Harmon. He's, he's obviously playing well. He's obviously an accurate player, but I think he's going to have to be closer to the pin than he has been last couple of weeks if he wants to win this thing. So I'm looking at elite ball strikers who maybe have been showing little peaks of good putting. And that's our guy, Cameron Young. I can see him as having the skill level in a field like this to finally break through. And I, I really like the number he has at plus 2,200. I know you don't like it. No, I want Cam Young to be good. You're like, waiting to see when Cam Young's going to pop. He's been inching towards his previous form from 2022. Obviously, he was in great form. He just couldn't get that trophy. Last year, he couldn't putt to save his life. This year, he's been better. And so I do think that his recent form tells me that his ball striking is going to be a big advantage here. Yeah, his putting is, though, it's so bad. He lost almost six strokes last week. Well, that's and before that, he lost four four 4.1. Uh, week before that, and the only reason that it's skewing some of our metrics is he gained almost four at the Cognizant. Yeah. Um, but, but I think these greens are more similar to the Cognizant than they are at Bay Hill and Sawgrass, which are extremely challenging putting environments where somebody who's not a strong putter like Cam Young is he's not going to do it. Like we, we did this with Willie Z at, at the players. It's like, okay, yeah, he's putting better, but Sawgrass greens are just different. And that's what happened with Willie Z is he could not make a putt at Sawgrass and Cam Young couldn't either. Yeah. Cam Young can't scramble though, either, man. I don't know. There's a lot of red flags for me here. And the, the thing about it was his approach game. Yes. Like he is gaining strokes on approach, which is important, but his off the tee game last week, when we got into a uh, situation where we de-emphasize de distance, emphasized accuracy off the tee, he spikes up and loses almost a stroke and a half. Um, so, I don't know. There's a lot of red flags for me on a course like this, uh, not the least of which is comparing it to the last couple of weeks on a little more challenging setups where he's losing four and a half to six and a half strokes um, scrambling, which is, again, he's not he's not gaining off the tee. He's going to be in the rough, though. and then he's not gaining on scrambling. So I don't know. I'm, I'm probably out on Cam Young. Yeah, I get it. It's, Agree to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he annihilates par fives and there's a, a few of those. It. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think that he's, uh, he's got the firepower and that's what I'm kind of looking for. And I feel like this, I know you're going to tell me that Min Woo Lee is a better play at 30 to one. I would is. strongly disagree with that. I, so two things that I love about Min Woo Lee is he, he proves that he can hang when it does get harder. He gets better. We've said that we've been saying that for weeks now. Yeah. He's he's at, he gained almost three strokes. It was 2.78 strokes at API 6.1 at the cognizant on approach. Like these are crazy approach numbers. And then off the tee, he's averaging like 3.3 strokes last week off the tee, you couple those two stats. And we already know that he can scramble and get up and down. His biggest thing, his biggest challenge comes really with the putter and and some of the around the green scrambling. Like his his short wedge or short wedge shots and putting aren't great, which is is going to be needed here. But he's had moments of brilliance with that. Um, and frankly, I just think he's in a lot better form and a lot more consistent form than Cam Young around the same number. So Min Woo's going to get my vote again this week. Yeah, for whatever reason, he's showing as uh, one of the worst approach players in this field in my modeling. Uh, last 36 holes, it's a little bit better over the last 24, uh, but he's 54th in my model as 117th at, on strokes gain on approach and 116th in greens and regulation gained. 
Uh, that's uh, not good. And his putting is 46, so I'm not really worried about that. But he scores on par fives just like Cam Young. He's incredibly good at putting the ball in the fairway uh, with various clubs, driver, you name it, utility club. This guy's a really good uh, off the tee player. But I'm kind of bearish on his on, a, on his approach game compared to you. I think that's where the difference lies is that my approach numbers show that he's one of the worst in this field. With yeah, that's because you're 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 waiting you're waiting last week heavily in there with the the spectrum that you ran because he did lose almost four strokes on approach last week at the players and that was a down week for him. But the previous two weeks, yeah. uh, he's pretty much. And plus, I'm waiting the long approach distances where he really struggles. Yeah, he did. He did not have a good week last week. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, that's like only I, four of the thirty six rounds, though, Connor. <laughs> We shall see, Bo. We shall. I see. love Minwoo Lee. I just think that he's the second best Lee in his family, I, golfing wise. Minji is incredible. I don't disagree, but he, uh, <laughs> like we said last I just, week, yeah, I I can't, I can't see it with Minwoo. I'd rather play Cam, if especially if Cam's number starts to slip closer to twenty five, twenty eight. Uh, that would be choice for me. Uh, anybody no else? I, I know we agree on the next guy. Like, is there anybody like less than forty to one that you're that you're looking at? Anybody else? Nick Taylor is one of mine. Yeah, Nick Taylor, I've got some interest in. And uh, shout out to our Canadian fans. It really was Nick Taylor. Nick Taylor was the the big one at uh, thirty five yeah. to one. Um, yeah. I, I know you and I both are all over Doug Gim. I'll let you kick off Doug Gim. Uh, just an incredibly accurate off the tee player. He makes a ton of birdies. Uh, he's a pin seeker and that gets him into trouble. His bogey avoidance is not good, but Doug Gim can score with the best of them, especially if he's still like top five in this field off the tee. As far as good drives gained, he's just one of the best off the tee guys you can find. His approach game has been on fire lately, which is why he's been in the hunt so many times in the last month. Uh, you can't say enough good things about a guy this hot that it's still 45 to one in this, in this weaker field. Uh, that's a really soft line for a really, really good hot player that fits this course like a glove. So yeah, that's, that's what I'll say about Doug Gim is the odds are right. The the player is scorching hot right now and he can score with anybody in any, in any conditions he's been, he's been scoring well the last month, no matter what happens. For sure. We liked him last week. And to your point mm -hmm. on scoring metrics, I mean, he crushes par fives. Um, he annihilates I, par fives. It's, as a matter of fact, in, in my models, last 36 yeah. rounds, he's right now uh, one of the top three. Yeah, he's for, fourth uh, in mine. Strokes in gained par on par fives. Yeah. So, second in fairways gained. He's also got, he also rates out second in strokes gained around the green. Uh, and especially yeah. in the shorter scrambling situations when he does miss green. Mm -hmm. So he's getting up and down, saving his own ass. And to your point, uh, he's been pretty darn accurate off the tee. Um, so I, I think it fits him really well here. I think arguably it fits, it fits him better than last week. And we were all over him last week too. So 40 to one yeah, seems the right number. He's not the strongest putter, but that's not a heavy emphasis this week. So no, I think I, that's going to be I, really up and down for everybody. Yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gim's one of my favorite plays. He came in, let's see, 11th in my model, which is outstanding for his odds. Um, I dropped down pretty far after Doug Gim because a lot of these long shot guys have some pretty soft odds for how well they're playing. Admittedly, I've got it. I've got a pretty, pretty small card this week. So I, uh, I am going to go back to Aaron Rye. Um, I like a lot of the, just the kind of consistent yeah. form he's in, uh, Long 45 approaches, 45 to one. Um, I don't think he's 50 now. If he's 50 now, it's even better. And I don't think he's a horribly dissimilar player type to, uh, Doug Gim, who we just talked about. So, uh, I do like Gim better, but it's, again, it's the same type of guy. Um, and then uh, Thor, Bjorn, Thor Bjorn Olison at uh, yeah. um, 70 to one is another guy that like didn't pop necessarily in my custom modeling, but just looking at just the overall basic stroke gain metrics, 
Yeah. Um, he, he came out number one before I put any filtering on it. So um, I just like the all around prowess of him. He's good off the tee, good on approach, uh, consistent player and 70 to one. It just seems like a, a misprice for, for somebody who actually has the chops to win here. No problem. So. Yeah. And it's uh, it's kind of the kind of the place that he would do well at. Uh, you have other accuracy bent players. Adam Shank is here. Taylor Moore is the defending champion. I don't see him going back to back, but um, Brendan Todd, the Todd father is an accuracy built player. Uh, Daniel Berger, the ultimate stat darling hasn't done anything for us ever, but he's popping up as top 10 in my model again, somehow same with Lucas Glover. I was like, I can't, I can't with these guys that pop up in the, in every single ball striking metric that we're looking at heavily weighted towards certain things that, I know he hasn't done well in months, and yet he still pops up to the top here. Uh, I don't understand how these how these guys pop up to the top when they're just not getting any results. Yeah, I'm a little perplexed on some of the modeling that shows those guys where it does. I had to run mine a couple different ways to get them to slide yeah. down at all, and they were still kind of popping up. I think talking about the two of them, I, I would prefer Berger if Berger – Berger would be the one that I would I would prefer in tougher, windy uh, conditions. Yeah, especially um, with his off the tee game. Yeah, so if I had to pick one of them, it's Berger. I honestly probably don't get to either of them this week. Maybe right. a couple sprinkles in DFS. Uh, as we get longer, I have a, a trio of gentlemen in the at a hundred to one or more, and then one of those is at deeper than three hundred. And we, I think, we're gonna have a beer bet on our hands. Um, but how about our guy, Joel Damon last week with the T 11 to make 600 K. Uh, we, we just saw the full swing season two episode where they caught back up with him at, after he became Netflix famous and he was struggling. Like this guy's been playing absolutely terrible the last year since full swing came out and where he went from 70th of the world to 130th and, he comes out and he says, fuck it. Let's just swing the club and play golf. And he goes out there and goes T11 at the players, which has a gigantic prize purse. And I, I bet you that 600K feels really good right now because uh, this is another accuracy-based course where he thrives. And I, I love his new mindset. It's just, fuck it, let's play golf. And I love him at 100 to 1. Like, Joel Damon's got all this talent. He's just He was in his own head. And I think once he cracked out of that, he's 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 one of my favorites here because this is a, this is a place where Joel Damon can score. I like the number. He scares me off the tee. Uh, he did get it together last week, which I'll give it to him. Mm -hmm. But he has been struggling off the tee for yeah. all the rest of his starts so far this year. So that part that part makes me nervous and. He actually last week for the first time all year so far uh, gained on approach too. So um, I think a hundred to one on Joel Damon, it's one of those opportunities to be early on a guy if he is in fact back. So that's probably the positive side of, of betting Joel Damon. Yeah, it is risky for sure <laughs> <laughs> because uh, other than the players, uh, Joel Damon struggle bus. One of the salt of the earth, dude. Love him. Love oh, Gino Benelli. Like I, I met, hope. I met him and Gino, and we're talking the realest of the real. Like they're they are exactly like they are on the TV show. Exactly, there is no difference whatsoever. Gino is the nicest human on the planet. I'm glad he got his 60k cut of that of that prize last week because, like, you, Gino's just like he's he's not going to abandon his best friend. And it, it really helps to not have those thoughts when your best friend helps you make some real money this year. <laughs> no. And, and I find myself and I, when they got Joel on TV, I find myself like kind of muttering, come on, Joel, come on, Joel, come on, like, Joel. I, I want to <laughs> see him do well, you know? So it's a fun God, one to root for a, and triple digit. Dude. Yeah. Like hundred. I like, I like the hundred be early on Joel. He'll, uh, he'll find his way. I'm a Joel Damon Homer, but I'm also a, big bud collie fan like what what better story than the guy who almost loses his life in a car accident in 2018 
and hadn't been in competitive golf since then. And he's back. And this is a very, very talented golfer. And I think a poor man's Wyndham Clark in a way. He's coming at 130 to one. This guy is playing out of his mind on golf courses like this. He's hot. He made me some money last a couple weeks ago. So uh, give me Bud Colley. He's popping up to the very top of my model because of his his TD Green game. So I wouldn't even call him poor man uh, Wyndham Clark. I would just say he's like he's like the sh- the short man's version of Wyndham Clark. <laughs> like he's like fifth you- in my model overall. <laughs> Number no, one in you, bogey avoidance, number one in par threes over 200 yards, number eight in tee to green. I think that I think where approach. I was going with that is like it's not it's not that I doubt any of his stats, like because this he was a hell of a golfer before his accident. He's already proven to be a hell of a golfer coming back. I think mm-hmm. what really turned me on with him this week oh, is he's, he's a on. He's a short driver, Honor aroused short driver with accuracy. This is a guy that averages like 282 off the tee, but he hits but he fairways. Never misses. <laughs> and and I'm telling you here, I don't. I think it's more about the placement. I think anybody who's got half a brain would tell you that. Uh, so a little shorter guy off the tee that has a great control of his driver. I really like Bud Colley here, um, and he's rounding back into form, and it's taking him next to no time to get it going. And he's been crushing the par fours and par fives alike. Uh, And number one in those long par threes, which is huge. So he's scoring really well this season. And even though he's 80th in this field and birdies are better, but he's still scoring. Like he's adding, he's gaining strokes on these holes that we're going to come across at the balance bar. Uh, 130 to one for a guy means we're, we were already early on him a couple of weeks ago with the top 20 bet. And now we're going to be early on him again when he gets a top 10 this week. That's what I'm, I'm going to do a top 10 and a top 20 bet with a $5 YOLO bet at 130 to one on Bud Colley. Cause he, he damn near won a couple weeks ago. Damn near. I'm a hundred percent in on him. He's one of, he's one of the guys down there that I'm looking at. I'm in love with him in DFS too. So we'll, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, my last one, is, my last one is somebody who I, it's a little, it's probably a little off the beaten path. People don't probably know who it is and it's 300 to one. So I don't know if yours is a little shorter than that. If you want to go first, no, or... mine's longer, mine's longer. Go ahead. All right. So my 300 to one, my, I've done way dumber shit with $5, uh, is Hayden Springer. I've heard of Hayden Springer. <laughs> I, I have heard... not heard of. Jimmy Stanger from last week. I've been playing. You didn't even mention here. him, but he was in our head to head lineup. Didn't work out for you, but Jimmy that Stanger. Like I'm like, who the fuck is Jimmy Stanger? I've been playing Jimmy Stanger for like a couple weeks now and just not really saying anything about it because I like, <laughs> who I always the hell is up, this guy. I always find these. I like, saw him on TV and I was like, oh, he's a real damn golfer. I never even heard of this guy. I, f- I find these guys down at the bottom and like, it's not that people haven't ever heard of him, but like people don't scroll down far enough to find him. So. Yeah. But with Hayden Springer, um, just for 300 to 1, it, this is actually not a bad bet. He's coming off of a T3 in Puerto Rico. A lot of long shots this year. And he's made three out of his four cuts so far this season. He gained almost 10 and a half strokes to the field in Puerto Rico. Uh, approach game is bordering on an elite level uh, over the last four starts. He's about one and a half strokes to the field per round. He's so off the tee right game. Now has been at minimum two strokes game per round of the field. Um, and the stat that I loved about him, he is absolutely probably the best putter in this field. I ran it on Bermuda. I ran it on POA. I ran it on a combination of the two. Every way I ran it, he rates out number one in this field for putting and around the green. So uh, Hayden Springer might be the real deal. And you can also get a really nice top five at 50 to one, top 10 at uh, 200 to one. And then I, uh, or I'm sorry, top 10 at uh, 20 to one, top uh, 20 at eight to one and a top 40 at two and a half. So it's, uh, there's some good numbers on this guy. And he actually, I really genuinely believe he's going to compete. I mean, he hits greens and bunches, 71% uh, greens and regulation rate. Um, yeah, I think he's, I think he's, uh, I think he's a real dude this week. Yeah, I, I see that. And let's go to my model here and my guy. 
I I actually had to look him up, and when I looked him up, I liked him even more. But <laughs> it's <just> so wild. <laughs> oh shoot! Should we re- reiterate that's Hayden Springer and not Stringer? Hayden, yeah, uh, <laughs> Hayden Rum Springer. <laughs> For, for our Amish viewers that aren't watching because they don't use technology. Hayden Rumspringer. <laughs> uh, my guy is Kevin Roy, who's coming in at 350 to 1. And he's 24th in my most recent model. He was number 8 in my first run model. And this guy is just an incredible long iron player. He annihilates par 5s. And he's 11th in this field on approach, 20th in ball striking, and for a long shot, I'm looking at this guy going, okay, what is he doing? And he's a Corn Ferry Tour guy that's 13th in the points on Corn Ferry. He's He hasn't missed a cut this season. I just I think that this guy is going to make a push for top 20, top 40. And I've definitely done dumber shit today already with five bucks than betting a guy who's playing well uh, coming into an event that fits his game. Patrick was son. He just couldn't hack it as a hockey goalie. So <laughs> the reverse happy Gilmore. Kevin Wah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh he's from Rochester, so I don't think ah, it's related guy. to yeah. <laughs> it's close. Same spelling. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, so we're we're gonna do a beer bet on our long shots because last week it was a good start for Hoagie, but Sung Jay got him in the end. Um Joking aside, Kevin Kevin Roy pops in mind. He is somebody that we've put into our pools before. Um, again, he's another guy that's like a, a, a real player down here at those odds. Like he can actually compete. Um, yeah. So if you're looking for just like a couple of off the wall, off the beaten path, you know, throw five, 10 bucks at it. These are, these are two guys that actually could pop up. Let's go beer bet. Kevin Roy and Hayden Rom Springer. <laughs> <laughs> Shall All we? right, you you ready to do some DFSing? Yeah, I suppose we should probably do that, huh? You were slamming trunks last week. It was great. Yeah, I hate I hated my life. <laughs> you hate losing to me. I know that. <laughs> oh, it just grinds my gears. I'm at the bar on Sunday, just cursing your name. <laughs> Love it. The club is wet. This would be a wrestling club. Yep. Well, DFS, I prevailed last week. I had a really good player pool. I expanded the player pool out. I didn't have anybody over 20% exposure, uh, which meant I had a good amount of Scotty. I had a good amount of Xander. I had a great amount of Harmon and all the other guys that ended up at the top. Had a hole surrounded. I had a couple six for six lineups that really paid off. Yeah, aroused. I just want to like clip that one so I can just put it up randomly when you're talking. <laughs> well, there's a lot of chalk at the top this week, and we're going to have to navigate it because it's not like we're going to fade all these guys that are coming at 30%. Are we, Connor? No, as a matter of fact, I'm probably eating some chalk. <laughs> we're eating a lot of chalk at the top, guys. Yeah. We're going to have uh, to get really creative in the middle because this is a chalk fest. Yeah, at the, at the top, the, the, I think the challenging thing is – Xander at 11 two is right at that price point where I, I I can't decide if I'm, if I'm okay with him being in like a top three. Cause I think if you look at what he's got to return to cover that cost, I think a top three would get it done for you. Yeah. I just don't know. Estimated 33% owned. Yeah. But what I'm saying is the cost per uh, the uh, points per dollar quotient, like he's, in, at least in my model, he rates out as like the second highest projected. They're projecting him around 79 and maybe a half points. Yeah. And then, so I, I don't know. 11 2 just seems steep for him on a guy that like I could see, I could see being in the top three, but I could very easily see him falling somewhere between, you know, somewhere in the top 10 too, which isn't going to get it done for you. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. We got Sam Burns is probably your number one projected. Am I right? Uh, he's so he was number one projected in points for me. Yeah, he uh, 
Yeah. It's interesting though, as far as my custom modeling went, uh, trying to build out DFS lineups, he was, he was considerably farther down the board for me um, mm. somehow uh, in terms of value to what I rated. 30% but, owned. Yeah. And I think 10, nine is, is tricky with Sam Burns too. Like I, I this is going to sound crazy and I don't like him. I don't necessarily love him for the course, but I love the roster ship projection and Jordan Spieth may be where I start a lot of lineups with. He's um, definitely leverage 10%, 10% in a C of 25 to 30. Uh, Cause you have Brian Harmon right below him at 25% estimated. Uh, Jordan Spieth is leverage city and no, you hate, you obviously hate the course fit, but DFS is not about the same thing as betting. You cannot ignore a $10,000 golfer. That's way less chalky than everybody else. Because if you're on Jordan Spieth and he comes to play with the, the talent that he has, uh, you're, you're winning over 90% of the field. Anytime Rosie gets excited, that's usually a good sign. That usually means we hit on one. Uh, yeah, just to just to kind of round out Jordan Spieth, like here's the thing. Like, I don't necessarily like how he sets up here. I don't even necessarily like the form he's in, but Jordan Spieth is a guy that can score a lot of points for you. And so the the upside with Jordan is a ton of points, and he's not somebody that's like a stranger to winning, right? So he could definitely be in the mix and, and take this down. So a 10% projected roster ship in comparison to everyone around him who are projected at 25 to 32%. Um you know, a little bit of game theory here. I'm just going to, I'm going to green flag racing, pinch my nose and, and hope for the best with Jordan Spieth. Cause he's probably my, Pray least. he can find the fairway with the map. Good Lord. Pray. Yeah. Fit, fit wise. He's probably my least favorite in that group, but I mean, that's a that's really the field. The field agrees with that. And that's the problem is on DraftKings, you have to be different and it's more important to be different than right. In a lot of cases, especially when there's this much concentrated chalk. So I'm going to take a couple shots. I have found some interesting ways um, to like double and triple stack the top with some of the, yeah. some of the bombs that we're talking about down in the five K's. So <laughs> I've done um, the same thing. <laughs> so there's, there's some really kind of fun lineups you can do this week. I don't know that I'm going to over invest in DFS period this week. I think there's probably a lot of volatility and it's going to be really difficult to get the right mix in the right roster ship. But um, Your yeah, that's probably definitely leveraged though. That's a, that's a good one for you. Yeah, and I don't actually hate the idea of starting. We can jump down there because I got zero interest in Sung Jay. I got zero interest in Tony Fee now. Nick Taylor and Min Woo are probably uh, the next two that I'm really actually interested in playing. Um, and what I would say about the two of them is at 9109 grand, respectfully, they they offer you some really interesting ways to build balanced lineups. And um, if you're not going wild and crazy and like double and triple stack in the top and trying to find bombs at the bottom, um, I would highly recommend you build a very balanced lineup and just kind of try and have your last man in be around in that $7,200 range. So you can definitely get these two dudes, uh, Nick Taylor and Min Wu, start your lineup there and you can build a pretty balanced, pretty respectful lineup. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Uh, yeah. And as you go down here, as we get into the eights, Cashmere uh, Keith is an easy chalk fade for me. At coming at 20 percent uh he has not played this course well despite being a bermuda florida swing specialist uh keith mitchell has played the valves bar very poorly uh and 20 percent owned for him at 8900 which is overpriced to begin with i'd much rather go down five percent in projected ownership and play bez christian bezadenhut is uh, 8800 and he comes in much more favorably in this type of event where accuracy and scrambling and putting matter. Uh, just putting a score on the card as, as the conditions get tougher, Bez really shows out here. And I'd, I'd much rather play him or even Aaron Rye down there at, that's also chalky. Doug Gim is chalky, but those are guys I'm going to eat chalk on because they're cheaper and I, I just know they're going to fare better than a chalky Keith Mitchell. Am I missing something here? No, I think Keith Mitchell, what he's been doing really well is his off the tee game. And that right. he's that one of the best tee guys off the tee guys on the tour. And that definitely carries over to here. I don't see any reason to think that he's not going to have another, um, you know, off the tee, good off the tee week. I also, his approach game has been good, but he, when he misses, he can't get up and down and, 
you know, his putting, it's there's sad. there's this whole narrative, and it's not really a narrative, I guess. It's just a <laughs> perspective that he puts so much better on Bermuda. Well, he doesn't actually. He put, at least not this he season. Puts I mean, it, he puts poorly everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like he may have won on Bermuda at one point, but like it's not it doesn't hold true anymore. When you're just a bad putter, you're a bad putter. And Keith Mitchell is right. just a bad putter. Um, He's not good. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm with you. I know there's a lot of hype train going with Keith Mitchell. Um, but no, I, I'm with you. Bez rates out a hell of a lot better for me. He rates out a ton better, actually, even in the approach metric. So I would be, uh, I would be taking some swings at Bez. Um, and I already talked about how I really like Aaron Rye, who's gaining in almost every category. And you get uh, mm-hmm. the thing about Aaron Rye is he's actually, I'm not alone. He's uh, he's creeping up there. Aaron Rye and Doug 100%. Gim, um, 85 and 84, are both right in that 20, uh, 18 yeah. to 22% roster ship projection. So, yep. And you said that, that that's some chalk that we're looking at eating. So, um, an interesting pivot in there, I think, is Bo Hostler, who. Yep is uh projected in single digit roster ship. Uh, yeah. I would like him a little bit more where like distance off the tee mattered a little bit more. Um, yeah. But his approach I, game is not great. I do think that it's stout enough though. And he just has these crazy weeks where he can pop. So um, I may do some, some interesting pivots there and do a little bit of Bo Hostler, maybe a little bit of Mav McNeely, but even Mav's creeping up there. So this is the range where people are really building out their lineups in this eight, about 86 down to 82. Yeah, and I'm looking to fade McNeely, even though he's hot. It's it, For me, it's going to be avoiding the chalky guys that I don't like as much because as we get into the lower pricing, you're going to see a couple guys that pop up that are you can tell are model based <laughs> the chalk guys like Lucas Glover hasn't done shit in months and yet he's coming up at fifteen percent. Sam Ryder uh is gonna be in my pool over him and at fifteen percent owned at the same price but I'm getting I'm getting edges everywhere I go. Daniel Berger's chalky here. I don't necessarily like Berger for DFS. I think that he models well here because he models well everywhere but he doesn't score DFS points. And it's it's scary to say, but I'd rather pivot to Adam Shank and or Davis Thompson, who's single digits. Those both both those guys rate out better for me. And so finding those little pivot points is going to be really important because there's certain guys down here that are very popular that I don't want any part of. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I I'll probably have my my fair share of Rio again. Um, he really hasn't yeah. completely screwed me yet. Um, no, he he's not quite there. But down in this range, um, you know, I Jimmy Stranger, who I've been playing, I don't know that I necessarily like the fit here. Um, yeah. I probably will have some shares of him just because he's been he's been playing pretty well. Um, I just don't have a whole, I don't have enough stats to back up why it might be a good idea to play him here. Just know that it's somebody that I've been playing. Um, and really Joel Damon, we already talked about 13%. I can probably be okay with playing some Joel Damon at 13% projection. Yeah. So um, I think I maxed him out at 15% just to have some. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate the Joel Damon play. And I, I do think that he'll make the cut. In DFS, I feel a lot more confident uh, that we're yeah. going to be early in some capacity with Joel. Like, I think he'll I think he'll compete this week. I think he's finding it. Uh, the outright, the outright, like I said, 100 to 1 is pretty reflective of the risk there. But uh, he could definitely yeah. do it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And then getting down into the sixes, I guess. Um, <laughs> Andrew Novak is chalky. Why? Why? <laughs> There's some weird chalk in here for sure this week. I, Bud Colley, uh, it coming up on 10%. That's again more chalk I'm going to eat. I just, I'm, I'm not going to be late to the party on Bud Colley. No, um, it's too much fun. Victor Perez is chalky. What the hell? Yeah, Victor Perez is getting some, uh, getting some steam behind him. Where's he at? 72 68. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm I couldn't just quite get it couldn't quite put my finger on why. I mean, he, he does seem to be a good course fit here. The scrambling stats concern me and his putting stats definitely concern me. Um, so Carson I, young chalk. 
Yeah, and Carson Young, I actually probably will will have some shares of. I'll I'll eat some chalk down here. Um, I'm not super jazzed on Carson Young. Um, this I'm playing T Dunk though. T Dunk. T Dunk at 5800. That's fun. <laughs> What, That's Tyler what Duncan for the uninitiated. Yeah, the T-Dunk. Um, Hayden Springer, I have to add to the pool. Yep, Hayden Springer. Um, God, I want to play Sammy Valamaki so bad, but not in the wind. Oh, he gets the ball he too high. bad ear. Um, the, the guy Chan that knows, Kim is a guy that pops up for me, too. That's 6,200. And Chan Kim's been playing well, so he's another guy that down here, if you're looking to fill 1. out one point four percent That's That's nice. Other than that, like I've got my usual dart throws down here. I'm trying my best to not be down here. Kevin Doherty, yeah. we've played a little. Charlie uh, Hoffman rated super high, and I just ignored it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like Raphael Campos rated really well for me here. <laughs> God. Yeah. So, so best advice: stay, <laughs> try and stay north of the uh, of the fives Six and the sixes. Day. Yeah. <laughs> I have two guys in the fives, and it's Kevin Roy and uh, and your guy that we just added, Hayden. And, oh, and I think if you're down, I think if you're Tyler down here, Duncan. dude, I think if you're down here, like those two have just as much uh, make the cut equity as any of these other guys. So I probably yeah. won't deviate too much from them. And since I'll be maxing out my exposure at the top, like a lot of lineups, I'll start in the nines. I don't think I'll have to be down here very often. Here's hoping. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Stanger, good lord! I saw, make... I saw your, I saw him in your lineup. I was like, who the fuck is Jimmy Stanger? <laughs> like, like, not only is have I never heard of this guy, but he's in a head-to-head lineup against me. I was blown away that you went there, and he I didn't had... kill you. He was not the one that killed you. I had, I've had him in multiple lineups the last few weeks. I'm telling you, he's been doing good. I'm hoping I'm hoping my boy Hayden is the next up in my uh, randomness at the bottom of these lineups. Yeah, he's he's not Hayden Buckley. He's Hayden Rum Springer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Who you got winning? I have Doug Gim. I just love Doug Gim this week. Damn you! I kind of wanted that one. Uh, I'm gonna go Sam Burns. I'm. I think. I think he gets it. Three done. out of four years, man. That's that's impressive. He's definitely got good juju here. <laughs> Who are you thinking first round leader? I was gonna say Sam Burns first round leader. Yeah, and I I mean because when the weather's neutral, like I know what he is on a neutral uh vowels bar. Like he loves it here. I think that when the weather picks up, he's he might get lost in the shuffle. But uh Thursday when the weather's mild still. Uh, he's going to come out hair on fire. 28 to one too. That's nice. Yeah. That's, that's probably, I probably I'd bet that I put that like, if you're watching the show right now, put that right now, 28 to one first round leader, Sam Burns. That's, that's smart money. Yeah. I, I'm not going to deviate from that. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Sam Burns first round leader with you. I, I think that's, I think that's pretty, pretty possible strong, given the situation. Very strong. So, um, All right. Well, what's your winning score? You gonna go eleven? I'm gonna go eleven. I'll go nine just to be apart because obviously we were a little bit under. Like I think we had seventeen and eighteen last week, and Scotty won at twenty because he's a freak. <laughs> Aroused. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, well, I next think week uh, we're going to Texas. So getting real it's getting real real the we're coming Texas up on, one i heard we're there's some big i heard there's some big tournaments coming up yeah and uh bo hostler's in play in texas for sure <laughs> what's that one with the green jacket when's that one that's uh just a month away down magnolia lane it's gonna be a great time uh get the get jake knapp now <laughs> right Jake Knapp and Ludwig, I'm t- the, still hanging good numbers on them. Yeah, I just don't know who can beat Scotty or John Rom in the Masters. Like those two guys at the top. Oh, and Brooks will be there. You know, Brooks is going to be in contention. Like that's <sighs> that's gonna be that's gonna be crazy. God, I should probably do some research and get an article out or something about that. Hmm. 
Yeah, Hayden Springer looking good. If he if he wins and gets into the Masters, <laughs> you'll be richer and excited to talk about him. <laughs> lock it, up, lock it in. <laughs> All right. Well, cheers to you. Happy birthday again. Yeah, yeah. All right. Join us next week for the Texas Swing. I think they're doing. What is it the Shell Houston Open next week, or is it the is it San Antonio? Uh, I think it's Shell. God, why do we do this every week? You'd think that one of us would look it up. We're Houston so Open. in. Yeah, Houston we're still Open. in. Okay, Shell Houston Open next week. Uh, this has been the 19th hole. Make sure you like and subscribe. Jingle the bell. And this is uh, this is the Valspar. So get ready for some carnage. And hit us up on Twitter at the handles you see below. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>